all the all the debt that was paid off at the end, it added up to 987,000 something. I forgot the exact number, but nearly a million dollars. Imagine paying off almost a million dollars in debt and then flipping the scripts and having almost a million dollars in assets. In today's episode, we dive into this incredible journey with Nasima McKilroy. She's a dedicated nurse practitioner, a loving mom, and now she's a financial powerhouse. Her story is extremely inspiring, and I hope that every one of you young professionals out there realize you could be in the same exact position as she is within a few years. With that being said, let's jump into it. Welcome to another episode of the Fitbox Podcast. If you're all watching on YouTube, welcome there as well. We've got a special episode today. Uh, Nasima McIlroy of uh, Financially Intentional is joining us to share with us her story. Hell of a story, actually. I, I'm really looking forward to, to getting you know more of the details on it, and also you know what she's doing now. Um, and I don't I don't want to give away too much yet. So before I do so, I just want to introduce you. How are you doing? Pretty good. Excited to be here. Excited to talk to you. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Now, I mean. Before I start talking about like, you know, you're, you've grown your audience on Instagram and all these mm -hmm. different things. And I say you're world famous now, but, uh, <laughs> you know, where let, let's go back because I, I mean, I know that you're in healthcare now, mm -hmm. but where did that journey start for you? Like way back, back when you were younger, like, how do you want to start getting into healthcare? So, um, initially I was raised by a single dad who made enough money so he didn't qualify for like assistance, but not enough money to provide, I mean, to have like health insurance through his job. He didn't get health insurance through his job and health insurance on his own was highly unaffordable, especially a single dad raising two young girls. And um, so my access to healthcare was through community clinics. And this was before Obamacare when pretty much everybody could get access to care and they couldn't like exclude for pre-existing conditions because I had asthma too. So that always kind of knocked out the, yeah. <laughs> the insurance like um, qualifications for us. But anyway, so my access to healthcare was through a community clinic. And if you've ever been to community clinics, you know, the wait times are really long. And if you have asthma like me, <laughs> to sit in a lobby for two hours while, you know, you are trying to breathe or, and then my dad didn't like hospital. So he would not take me to like an emergency room. Right. Yeah. He has like this phobia. And so anyway, I was like, I want to um, increase access to care. And as a child, like the only thing, you know, really about healthcare is like being a doctor maybe. And so I was like, okay, I'll be a pediatrician. Went to college was like, um, I was at USC and I started all my pre-med recs and then realized what doctors did. And I was like, no, I don't really want to do that. I'm not interested in any of this. And started, I literally took out my course catalog and went through every page and was like, well, what can I do? And so I stumbled upon healthcare administration. So actually my first career was in healthcare administration. Um, got uh, my bachelor's in public policy with an emphasis in ambulatory care management and then got a master's in healthcare administration and worked for one of the largest healthcare organizations in the country um, in administration as a fellow in multiple roles. So I worked all across the organization and then realized that that's not what I wanted to do either because a lot of my job was not impacting patient care. It was the business of healthcare. And we all kind of know what that is about. Mm -hmm. But I work with some amazing nurses and I love what they did. They seemed to have autonomy. Um, they seemed to love their jobs. And I was just like, you know what? At 25, I quit. I told them I was retiring because I was I was already a millionaire. I thought I was going to be a millionaire by 30, but I'm a millionaire at 25. Technically, I was because of real estate, but that's another issue, another story for another time. And then I was like, I'm going back to nursing school. So I took a year, did tons of prereqs and went into nursing and, you know, haven't looked back. I love nursing. I love the variety of um, options that you can do like a career and careers in nursing. And I've done a lot of things that I could have never imagined. Um, 
So and I always encourage people to go into nursing, <laughs> even if you don't like blood, because there's so many things nurses can do, right? Um, but yeah, that's how it started. It's my second career, and I love it. I'm and I've been doing it for over 15 years now. Yeah, I, I can never be a nurse. I can't stand needles. I I mean once you get past nursing school though, I mean like you can be a, a nurse in yeah. informatics. You can be a nurse. <laughs> no, <laughs> no blood, no urine, no needle. No, you don't have no. to even deal with <laughs> if you don't want to. So there's so many options. I mean, I've been in a fintech company that targeted nurses. You know what I'm saying? And because I was a nurse, I had special insight. So it's a it's a lot of options. Yeah, I yeah. always encourage people. Nurses, nursing is a great, rewarding career, and I've been able to make an impact like I thought I would as a child being a nurse, so I love yeah. it. No, that's cool. Yeah, this morning, yeah. like, quick side story, my my daughter had to get a cavity filled, and she's seven, and she, you know, my wife calls her, calls me, and she's like, you know, she, she needs you at the dentist. She wants you here, so I come in, oh. and I'm holding her hand, and they're, like, putting the numbing Novocaine in with the needle, you have to pass out. And I was just like, I can't be the dude. I can't do this. <laughs> and my daughter. Just from that little bit. That's so funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. And, and like you brought up the the asthma stuff too, and the waiting. Um, so my daughter has asthma as well, and like when she's sick, it's really bad, and and it's mm -hmm. like it's scary, especially as a little kid when you're waiting and you can't breathe, and it's just like yeah. As a parent, you're like, what am I supposed to do? And I mean, we only have to wait for like five minutes, let alone right. a few hours that you have to wait um, at some of those clinics and whatnot. It's just like, so definitely understand you on that. So like you went, so you went to USC, mm -hmm. changed course, mm -hmm. went back to school, <laughs> um, you know, financing of it all. Like, I know mm -hmm. that you talk a lot about paying off. Those of you that don't know, you paid off almost a million dollars in debt. Mm -hmm. um when you went to school by the time you finished your nursing um you know where did you go from there what type of debt did you have and just shine some light on that so when I graduated from nursing school I had over a hundred and eighty seven thousand dollars in debt when I paid it all off it was over two hundred thousand you know how interest works but um mm -hmm. a lot of that was from my nursing program so I did go to USC for six years and you know, USC is a private school and it's touted as, you know, university of spoiled children because it is super expensive to get into. However, the benefit of going to a private school and I'll just drop this gym for people versus like a public school is that they have huge endowments. So um, when I got there, you know, single dad again, my dad didn't have a lot of money. They were like, yeah, this is your dad's out of pocket. And my dad was like, I'm not paying that. I can't afford it. <laughs> and so I went to financial aid and I said, my daddy is not paying for this. And he said, he's not going to, you can do whatever you want to do, but he's not paying it. And it was like, okay, we'll just give you a grant. Yeah. So, so for uh, the undergrad, I got grants and then um, for grad school, I got a full scholarship. And so for six years at USC, um, where I graduated from graduate school in 2005, I had $40,000 in debt. So that was a, just a small chunk. And if you, I mean, that's a, a steal, right? It is. And, um, but when I went to graduate school, I went to UCSF, prestigious medical institution, um, public school, University of California. However, because UCSF is unique, in the fact that it's a graduate only school and the nursing program falls under like a special program because it is not a graduate degree initially to get your nursing licensure, which is the first year of the program that I was in. It was accelerated nursing program. Um, that year alone, just in fees was about $80,000. And then I did go on to get my master's in nursing as a family nurse practitioner. So those years, um, all in all, all that stuff total added up to 187000 Yeah. And then on top of that, um, other debt that yeah. you bring up, what other debt did you have that was on top just, of that? Just normal stuff, right? So when people say like, how did you have a million dollars in debt? I'm like, that's still so irresponsible. Mind you, none of this was credit card debt because I didn't have credit cards at that time. Yeah. Um, so it was taking out a loan against my 403B to put a down payment on my house. It was having cars. Um, 
like really that was like the biggest chunk like little little stuff that I had um blinds on my house to put blinds on the 36 windows of my house um I was married at one point in time and you know I added some of his debt on there it was a car like orthodontics like stuff like that so nothing out of the ordinary like yeah. all of the things that you're supposed to have so but I had never added it up and I bet a lot of people have never added up how much debt they have and then the biggest chunk I should say was my home and I don't know why people don't count their home as debt but it is definitely a debt it's actually probably one of the most interest you'll pay on anything ever in your life because if you have a loan against your home you're probably going to pay for it twice mm -hmm. like run, run those numbers back like look at your amortization table you are paying a lot for that home so it is definitely a debt and at the end of my debt-free journey once i had paid off over three hundred thousand dollars in debt i only owed like fifty thousand. some of that was from a divorce some of it was for the tax filing that i had to do because i was going through a divorce only owed fifty thousand. i did sell my house and all the all the debt that was paid off at the end it added up to nine hundred and eighty seven thousand something i forgot the exact number but nearly a million dollars and it's crazy because I started my platform to document my journey of paying off debt, right? And I um, was, was you know, just calculating like how much debt I had left, but it wasn't until everything had was paid off that I actually went back and calculated like how much I had actually paid off from 2005 to 2015 through 2017, which it only took me two and a half years to pay off this debt, right? Uh, <laughs> it was over a million dollars. And I was like, damn, like, that's a story. It sounds very clickbaity, but it is 100% accurate. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that's the part that I left out earlier, by the way, and you just touched on it. Not only was it a million dollars, but you did it in two and a half years. Like, yeah. that is yeah. phenomenal. We'll talk about a little bit more about how you did that, too. Cause, yes. Um, you know, the working and whatnot. But the other part that you know, people need to understand too is that you live in the Bay Area, which is I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Expensive. Yay. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. During that time, the medium home price was about seven hundred and fifty thousand. Now it's one point one million. So yeah, just to it's in perspective. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's ridiculous. A lot of people don't don't realize this from a financial perspective, but cost per square foot, the Bay Area is the most expensive place in the world. So like mm -hmm. you can look at Hong Kong, Switzerland, all these different places, the Bay Area, that that stat, last time I saw that was from, I believe, 2015. So mm -hmm. it might be outdated now, but it it is expensive to live there, which is one reason why I don't live there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you got out. You got out. You <laughs> I, left I, me I, here. <laughs> I escaped. I said, I'm out. Um, <laughs> see you later. And all my relatives won't come visit me because they don't want to see my house and then hear what I paid for it and get sick. And then so, be mad. So, <laughs> um, so that's, that's what it is. So you, you brought up the the website, um, mm -hmm. you know, talk about that journey a, a little bit. Why did you start the website? Just, you know, growing it. Cause we have a lot of people in our audience that are looking at things like how can I, you know, do side hustles or become self-employed and grow a, an Instagram influencer channel or a YouTube channel or whatnot. Just talk a little bit about that journey and how, how you started it and how it matriculated and grew and then go from there. The overnight success that wasn't overnight, right? So <laughs> yeah. um, I, started, I started this platform in 2016. And I'm going to share something with you that I, I've, I've never shared with anybody else. Oh, is awesome. that the reason why I like started this was because um, when I was going through my divorce, um, my husband was in jail. So, but before I decided to get divorced, my husband was in jail, partly because of abuse. Right. And, um, during the time he was in jail, I used to write him every day. <clears throat> so I wrote in this journal and I wrote him every day. And that taught me that I could do something consistently. And I was just like, why am I doing this for this mm -hmm. person? Like if I can do something with this level of consistency, I can do it for myself. And part of that, like in that the journal entries that I was writing him, it was like, okay, how much debt we have left and how I've been paying it off and all that kind of stuff. I was like, let me like actually use this to help people. And so during that time, 
I had my girlfriends over and they had no idea about like what was going on with me and my husband. But I was like, you know, I've been like doing this thing. I've been paying off debt. And I, with every debt I pay off, I feel so free. And I've never had this feeling before. I've never had this sense of control over my money before. And it feels amazing. And most of us had daughters. And I was just like, I want our daughters to be empowered with this information. If I like share this platform because I don't like repeating myself, I'm going to put everything out on a platform <laughs> where you guys can access it. Like, would you read this stuff? And it was like, yeah, of course. So in 2016, I sat down, I opened up Instagram. I started my website, like just did it all myself. And I just started documenting my journey and, um, you know, slowly it started getting picked up by um, media outlets, podcasts, newspapers, all this kind of stuff. And I was just like, oh, I'm just a nurse. Like, I'm just sharing my journey. Um, but later it turned into, you know, like the influencer stuff. But that, was, that came like years down the line after right. doing this and unintentional because I I never I never thought of myself as an influencer or, or wanting to be in this space. But literally, I would just have emails in my inbox of people that wanted to work with me. And then I got to a place a few years ago when I was just like, oh, okay, I'll, I, I guess I can do this. Like I'm ma making content on my own. And this is after like I had just done this um, challenge for myself again to, to be consistent of wanting to post every day and really like exploring how to tell my story and, and what resonated with people. And so I had been posting just every day sharing, you know, personal finance stuff, also just personal stuff about like things that I have gone through. And, you know, it, it, my platform started to really take off. And so, yeah, working now, I, I work with brands like that's primarily where you know, a lot of my income comes from. Um, but let me just say, um, it is so much easier just to go and work as a nurse than it is to be an influencer and people see the money behind influencing. And let me tell you, if I broke it down per hours that I spend, um, like working on the content and the stuff that I have done behind the scenes to grow my business and to be a more knowledgeable business owner, because I'm a nurse. Like I didn't, I wasn't taught business. Um, put it like this. If I was just stuck with being a nurse and just investing and doing the things that I know I could do to grow my wealth without worrying about having a platform, I'd be retired by now. Yeah. But I am passionate about sharing my story and, you know, giving people access to information that I feel like was intentionally gay kept from a lot of people. And so if I can be here and explain it to you in my, you know, chill, laid back West Oakland tone, you know, that's what I'm going to continue to do. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's funny because I, I I try to tell people the same thing all the time about just starting businesses in general. It's like <laughs> you got to love what you're doing because it's, yes. it's not like like what you see these coaches on the internet where they're like hey pay me ten thousand dollars and in three months you're going to be a millionaire like no that's not the way it works guys like no, it, it's, it's a lot of work and and you know i joke around like you talked about like retiring I, I say that to my wife probably at least once a month where i'm just like you know if i didn't start fit bucks like we would have been retired like probably five to ten years ago like well, why did i do this so yeah you know it, it's it's awesome shining light on that um and by the way, there's actually a quote on your site. I'm, I'm going to steal this, by the way. I want to know where you came up with this because this is a good one. You can't out earn ignorance. That is. You can't out earn is, your financial ignorance. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't know. I got it from Dave Ramsey or something, which you is know, you? He, he, he shall not be named. Yeah, no, I, I'll, you're correct. I'll quote you on that when I use it. <laughs> um Because I, I like that. Because like you, you know, mm -hmm. on your website, you talk about like you, you were making six figures. Yeah. And just because, and, and again, growing up in the Bay area, I saw this a lot because even though the cost of living is a lot there, a lot of people are making money there. And I can't tell you how many people I met that are making, you know, 200, 300, 400 grand a year. And those are some of the most indebted low yes. net worth individuals yes. I have ever seen yes. and ever met because they, they just don't have any clue about how all this stuff works. Um, so it's, it's amazing to see, but on that, on that note, you know, you, like you said, you pay this off in two and a half years, you know, just, you know, one or two tips or tricks right off the top of your head that, that you, that worked for you, um, in terms of saying, Hey, I, I need to discipline, I'm going to pay this off. Like what, what tips or tricks can you point to, 
from a high level that that you would recommend other people do? Of course, I'm going to tell you about budgeting. I'm going to tell you about the strategy that I used to pay it off. But ultimately, it was knowing it was possible for me. The whole mindset piece, I do not want to undermine. Like, I want people to understand that a lot of time, the reason why we're in a financial position that we're in is because of what's going on mentally, right? It's all psychological. It's, so the way that we fix it has to be psychological, the best thing I ever did was cultivate the information that I was taking in to achieve my goal. So I listened to personal finance podcasts, personal finance audiobooks because I have ADHD. I learned later in life. So I process things better, um, less auditorily. So um, I did that. And my social media, what I took in was just the people that I aspired to be like. Either they were like right there on the journey with me of financial freedom or they like had already achieved it. And those were the messages that I continued to hear every day. And so it became possible for me. And not only did it become possible for me, that became my circle of friends, right? Like, like in real life, like those people that I aspired to, I used to connect with, reach out and we've, I've gone on trips with them. Like I've been to their houses. Like these became my actual friends in real life. And it wasn't intentional. It was just like, these are the people that, that have made it possible for me. So of course I'm going to stay connected to them. So that was the biggest hack for me. On top of that, it was not just taking in that information. It was implementing that stuff. And hearing the messages repeated it over and over for me so that it normalized it. And what we have to understand is the reason why we're consumers, the reason why we have so much debt is because the messages to buy and consume are everywhere. Like yeah. they are coming from everywhere. So the only way to counter that is to feed yourself information on something else, on, on another way, you know? And so I was just like, okay, I'm hearing about investing, like no joke. I was so intimidated by investing. I had gone, gotten two master's degrees and I was just like, okay, I'm done with school. I'm just working now. I can focus now on the PhD level of intensity that I need to learn to invest because this seems so hard. But then listening to those messages and, and then hearing like, it's really not that hard. It's mm -hmm. just that people just make it seem like it's that hard because then you have to pay them to use <laughs> services, right? Uh, so <laughs> so yep. um, I was just like, okay, so I can do this and just did it. Did it imperfectly. Did it not understanding everything, but just starting to put those things in place while I'm learning, while I'm able to go in and fine tune. And just doing those things, um, again, the way that I paid off the debt, I understood how much was coming in and going out and then started setting goals to and prioritize my debt payoff, you know, prioritize my financial goals, whether it's investing debt payoff, I prioritize those things and then everything else fell into place, you know, like I had always heard, pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. I never understood what that meant in all actuality because nobody has spelled that out. But like really focusing on paying myself first. And if you have debt, the best way to pay yourself is to pay off that debt because you it is hard to gain any momentum in the market if you are having debt, especially high interest debt, right? So focus on paying off my debt. The way that I did that, and early on, I was a big Dave Ramsey follower, like listening to the debt free screams and all that stuff. So I adopted a lot of his mentality of zero based budgeting, the debt snowball, you know, paying off your listing all your debt high, lowest to highest and paying off your lowest debt and paying minimum payments on everything else and just knocking out debt, um, one debt after another. Um, I did that and it was great. The only thing that, you know, I feel like would have been more optimized is, you know, Dave Ramsey tells you not to invest while you're paying off debt. And so I really minimized my investments and that cost me uh, in those two and a half years, about $80,000 in lost mm -hmm. investment and all of that kind of stuff. So I wish I hadn't done that. And it actually 
I mentioned like around my divorce, like paying, I had to pay the IRS $30,000 was because I wasn't maximizing my pretext, my pretext contributions, which would have minimized my tax liability because I was listening to Dave Ramsey, but Dave Ramsey is for, you know, general public. You can't be dogmatic when it comes to personal finance. Like it is very nuanced. It is very personal. Um, and so for a high earning nurse in Northern California with a lot of taxes, um, stopping my investments wasn't beneficial in any kind of way for me. And that was a big lesson that I learned. And that's why I tell people like, they always want like this magic bullet. If I can do one thing to change my finances, what would it be? I don't know. It just depends on your situation. And it's probably just not one thing. It's probably a whole bunch of things, but don't think that because I did this and it worked for me, it'll work for you. You have to really understand personally how to change, you know, your situation around, but you can't lose by spending less than you make and investing the rest and making sure that you minimize the amount of debt that you have. Yeah, no, absolutely. And a, a number of things that you hit on on there. I mean, focus is one of the big things that we always talk about, Like, you know, you pick it, you go, you pick it, you go, you don't try to do 10 different things at the same time. And like you brought up the mental side of it. I'm huge on the mental side of it. I mean, I always say 70 to 80% is all mental. We call it at Fit Bucks. Like if you guys are listening to like the podcast or YouTube channel, you guys hear me say this term all the time, intangible financial freedom. Like yes. intangible is the mental side. How do you actually think about this? The dollars and cents, the, the that's like 20 or 30% of the outcome. Like that's the tangible portion, but you can't get there without the intangible. How do you think about right. it? Um, and I mean, I'm so apt on it, like within our technology, we haven't rolled this out to the public yet, but I have on the drawing board, like, like when you're tracking your financial plan, you're not just tracking the dollars and cents, but we have on the drawing board technologies that would be sending you like mental reminders morning and night, like when you wake up and when you go to sleep, like do like, think about this, think about this. And one of the big things you thought of, you touched on on that was your friends, the accountability. Like, mm -hmm. I can't tell you. Like we haven't rolled this part out on Fitbox yet either, but I'm so big on accountability yes. that we are actually going to give discounting pricing to people if they have an accountability on uh, uh, an accountability buddy on the platform. Like that that's mm -hmm. how important that piece is, is to say, this is who I'm accountable to. And you guys hold each other accountable to it. And like you said, you mm -hmm. end up becoming friends. You, you are who you hang out with at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Um, so all that stuff is, is, you know, extremely important. Now, earlier you, you had brought up your daughters and, you know, I know that that's really big. You brought up, you know, making sure that they understand the stuff and the freedom mm -hmm. side of it, how, how understanding money is partially freedom. Cause it's so involved in our lives, you know, just for a few minutes, touch on what you're doing there. I mean, my daughters are, are good. Right. But, um, I think a lot of what I'm doing for them is just modeling what, you know, having control of your money can do. But of course, I have set up their accounts. Um, they all have, you know, three kind of investment accounts. They have their retirement. They have their college savings funds. They have their brokerage account. They understand that they have money. But the biggest thing that I a lesson that I think that I have taught them, just like money wise, is the difference between being an owner and a consumer. And I like to say, like, I think kids are able to start investing once they start recognizing symbols, which it starts really early, probably before they turn two. Like they know where McDonald's is. They know what Starbucks is. They, they know that your car is a Tesla or whatever, you know? So they start recognizing these things. and But they also know because they're getting messages from school, from the drinks. Like everybody was, all these people were drinking Prime at one time. It was like the cool thing, right? And so like, okay, like that's all fine and dandy. Like I can buy you that, but I can also buy you the shares and like yep. if you want to put that in one of your accounts you can do that that way you can own that company and that will make you more money <laughs> than you know than anything else like yeah you can consume these things yeah and it'd be gone right you drink it and it's gone but it'll continue to make you money um another thing i encourage 
is my kids have way too much stuff. Like when I tell you they have way too much stuff, like stuff is overflowing. They don't even play with it. And like, you know, family is always trying to buy them things. And I'm just like, listen, don't buy them things. Please invest into their accounts. I don't care if it's their brokerage account. I don't care if there's, it's their college fund, but that money is going to continue to grow. Meanwhile, my house is, is filled with clutter, which I hate. <laughs> and um, toys that they just don't play with that is cute in the moment and they get that 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 adrenaline rush at first that they like got to sing and they're like so happy but five minutes later they're over it <laughs> and so like teaching them to understand that the gifts that they get um that it should be more like investments versus you know toys and then them understanding that and then also for my oldest daughter um she has an account um which uh incentivizes her to do chores and things around the house and then she gets a weekly allowance and get she has her own debit card which she can spend on and so you know it's just not all mommy's money when she goes to the store it's like like when they have to pay for things they actually like really think about like is this really worth it? So yeah, my kids are young. They're 10, five and one. And so it's, it's financial lessons geared towards them. But I think the biggest thing, the biggest lesson is how I'm able to maneuver because of what I do with my finances. And like, I'll tell you a funny story. My daughter um, went to the grocery store with her grandma and her grandma like filled the shopping cart up with so much stuff. And she's like, I don't understand why you're buying all this stuff. Like, it's, this just doesn't make sense. So my mommy is rich and she would never buy all of this stuff. <laughs> so they, they kind of get it, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I I mean, off, off, like when we were speaking a few weeks back and stuff, I mentioned like my daughter, she's already doing some of that stuff. She's seven years old. Like, mm -hmm. dad, I don't think I'm going to buy this toy because she has her own money. So she's like, dad, I don't think I'm going to mm -hmm. buy this toy because I can only see myself playing with it maybe one or two times and it's like okay mm -hmm. or she'll go into her toys and be like dad i don't play with this do you think i could sell it like i'm like uh-huh she's like mm -hmm. okay well sell it for me and give me the money i'm like oh so you're already delegating to others people <laughs> for you are all right i i i get it and she's like yeah well i don't have a, a facebook marketplace account dad i can't sell it like you have to do it for me and i'm like okay you're already you're already convincing people to do your work i like, I, I love it. You're already uh, a little entrepreneur. Fantastic. Love it. So, yeah. Uh, but I'm right there with you. Like, it starts young, you know, mm -hmm. and oftentimes people are like, oh, like, they're too young to learn. It's like, no, no, they're not. Yeah, because they're getting the messages anyway. Yeah. But it's up to you to kind of tailor those messages to the lessons that you actually want them to learn. Or else society is just going to tell them what they should think about money. Well, that's what I, I try to tell people about is that your your subconscious is developed between the ages of zero and seven years old. Mm -hmm. And those subliminal messages, you, you touched on a little bit earlier, but like those subliminal messages that we are getting as our youth and our music and our movies and our cartoons and everything else, none of it is geared towards saving and investing it's all spin 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 and and so it's like well if you're not going to teach them at that age what you think they're just magically like learn suddenly when they're 18 years old and you know the federal government saying hey here's a blank check to go to school like you know i don't i don't think it's going to happen then so all good stuff all good stuff um you know well i definitely want to thank you for coming on um you know, just let everybody know, you know, social media, everything, where can people find you? Um, if they want to reach out to you and chat with you, where to, where to go, where can they find you at? So I am on Instagram, mostly at Financially Intentional. I have a Financially Intentional podcast, which you've been an amazing guest on. And um, I have the financial, financiallyintentional.com. And if you like to listen to YouTube, all that stuff is over on YouTube as well. So anywhere Financially Intentional, or you can just kind of put it in your search in the SEMA, it'll probably be me. <laughs> perfect, yeah, perfect, 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 perfect. Well, again, thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, and I, you never know, we might have you back on in, in the future Yay. to get an update and, and where things are at. Now they don't, don't have debt. I like talking about investments. So we can <laughs> talk about that too. So thank you again. I love talking about investing. Yeah, Absolutely. You're very welcome. Perfect. <laughs>